Doctor Iván Puchávez, uh, joined to the Electrical and Microelectronic Engineering Department as an assistant professor in the fall of 2016. His current research interests include collaborations to explore high frequency and sensing application of new materials such as carbon nanotubes and other nanomaterials such as graphene, 2D metal chalcogenes, phosphorines, borofin nanowires, etc. He's also interested in expanding research of MEMS devices. In 2016, Dr. Puchares completed a two-year IC fellowship with the Chemical Engineering Department at Rochester Institute of Technology under Dr. Brian Landy. From 2011 to 2014, Dr. Puchades was a research assistant professor at RIT. His research focused on MEM devices, particularly in application of thermal, electrostatic, and piezoelectric MEM resonators, piezoelectric energy harvesting multisensor networks, and system integration. He also talked on their graduate courses in electrical engineering and graduate level microelectronic engineering courses in MEMS design. Fabrication and test. From 2000 to 2005, Dr. Puchades worked as a um, radio frequency device engineer and BICMOS technology develop, development uh, engineer for Motorola and Free Scale Semiconductor in Phoenix, Arizona. He was responsible for CMOS and high voltage technology integration at the 0 0.18 micrometers node and later resolution of several device engineering issues. Uh, welcome Dr. Puchades from Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, our speaker represent the topic terahertz communication based on graphene device. Doctor, you have uh, 30 minutes for your exposition. After this, we will have a question session of oh. 15 minutes and all the questions go to the end of the exposition. Dr. Puchades, please start your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Acevedo. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this uh, webinar. I wanna thank the Instituto Politecnico Nacional, it's an honor. And as Dr. Acevedo said, um, I'm in Rochester Institute of Technology, which is in Rochester, New York. And my talk is gonna be, I changed the title a little bit to represent uh, the presentation a little bit better, but we're gonna describe uh, graphene-based devices for terahertz communication systems. So the overall, art, the arching um, theme is the same, just a little bit spin on a different way. But anyway, before I, I get going on the technical aspects of it, I wanna show what where Rochester is. So if you look at New York City in this map, hopefully you can see my pointer, my laser pointer, but New York City would be located in here. Rochester is in the state of New York, closer to the border with Canada. We're near Niagara Falls and there's a lot of uh, nice places to visit. So I welcome anybody that is in the audience to come see us. Uh, here's a aerial view of the campus and we're located in the back here and, and we have some nice facilities and a, and a, a clean room where we do a lot of this work. Uh, we're at university with uh, about 20,000 students. And as you can see, we have mainly undergraduate but also some graduate students. And here's our undergraduates having some fun with uh, what they call humans versus zombies uh, um, event where they all chase each other around with Nerf guns. And here's a picture of what things are gonna look like in the bottom right corner, what things are gonna look like in a couple of weeks up here where we'll get covered with snow. So if there's any skiing fans out there, this is a good place to be for enjoying some winter, winter sports. All right, so that's the quick introduction on, on what's going on in Rochester. Uh, here's an outline of my talk. I'm gonna start by 
uh, talking about the case for terahertz communication systems. What is the motivation for doing this work? Some of the applications uh, on those systems, some of the challenges that the hardware still has, some of the hardware challenges. And then we'll, we'll briefly touch upon a solution which makes includes everything made out of graphene. So everything graphene for an RF communication system. Uh, then we'll talk about two specific aspects of it, which is the oscillator, so graphene-based oscillator and source, the efforts that we've carried on at RIT, and then a modulator uh, as, as part of that system. The antenna, we still have not been working on it, and the link king components between all of these are, have not been developed yet, but that's uh, we'll, we'll talk about those as well. So jump into the motivation. So um, as we all know, wireless communications have been growing rapidly. 5G is being uh, deployed currently. And here's some numbers. They have 8.8 .8 billion devices, 13.1 expected by 2023. This is in billions. Uh, not only there's a lot of devices, but we also need faster connect connections. 5G, it's up 20 gigabits per second. If we look at the evolution uh, between 1G to 5G, we've gone up from uh, one gigabytes uh, bits per second for 4G to expected 20 gigabits per second in 5G. But this is 2018, 2020 we're on now. What's gonna happen in the future? Well, we'll probably go on to 6G. What is 6G gonna be? Well, one of the proposals is that we're gonna be at terabits per second. And to do that, we're gonna need terahertz technology. Uh, so terahertz technology actually looks at the spectrum and uh, uh, sees an opportunity here to introduce an area that has not been utilized. So if we look at the current RF technologies, they're all bunched in here between zero and maybe 0.1 terahertz. If we look at the optical systems, they're all in the higher terahertz uh, uh, as far as the frequency goes. So there's this big gap here between half a terahertz all the way to 10 terahertz, which we're calling the no man's land. Okay, it's a high frequency, uh, not high enough to be optical, higher than current electronics. And this, there's a, a nice opportunity here with a lot of open bands for very high frequency communications. Uh, the fact that it's very large available bandwidth as well alleviates the spectrum problem. So it allows us to um, do things uh, or alleviate that, that spectrum area. And things, the applications that you can see in here are short, short range communications, such as uh, virtual reality communication. A lot of the virtual reality applications right uh, nowadays are lagging in terms of uh, quality and detail on the representations. That's because there's not enough data to really represent things as they should be. So this could get away from having any tether to your computer in the short range. Uh, here's another picture here, which we're also showing the short range communication could be done with terahertz uh, links, very high data transfers, but not only there, uh, also in the back hole, so in the final delivery of the information uh, in line of sight uh, situations, you could also use terahertz. Uh, and it has been shown that even though there's some water absorption at that frequency, it, you can find certain bands where you still have very low water absorption and obtain very long distance communication systems. Uh, in the same sense, you can also uh, think of the uh, satellites talking in terahertz and then downlinking at a slower rate uh, down to, to your hosts. Uh, another possible solution application that this is uh, geared towards is that you can make very small transceivers and antenna and there's one millimeter. Uh, you're not talking uh, the terahertz uh, being such a short wavelength, you can make very small devices. So uh, you can also do with, you, with that aspect, you can do chip to chip communication or device to device wireless communication. You don't need to use copper wires to connect anymore. You can do that wirelessly. And you can also start looking at the bio um, aspect of it. So you can communicate through some tissue layers uh, internally 
at that frequency. And there's other things such as uh, brain neurons and, and so on that can be applied as well. So uh, two aspects, I guess, will be high, high data transfer and also small sizes. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's, it's worth pursuing and that it's worth working on. Uh, the problem now is that there's a lack of hardware to do this. Uh, as we showed earlier, there's a, there's a gap in there uh, and we gotta close that gap. There's two approaches to close that gap. There's the electronics approach, which we're actually pushing the limits of the electronics up. Um, uh, the examples here are frequency multiplying chains, resonant tunneling, tunneling diodes, and some vacuum electronics. And the advantage here is this is high power, but again, we're coming from low frequency, multiplying it to get up to the terahertz regime. The photonics approach is to come down from their high frequencies. And this is where they're in the hundreds of terahertz. They have to come down to the single terahertz. And what we do in here is actually cut down the frequency or even use some uh, quantum cascade lasers or some photoconductive antennas to get slower uh, because they're too fast. Our approach here is to use some of the new 2D materials, uh, which are intrinsically in the terahertz. Um, and our approach is to use graphene materials. And the idea is to do everything monolith monolithically in one chip. So on-chip graphene base, plasmonic receivers, antennas, and antennas arrays. Okay. So uh, as Dr. Fei Ho has shown, uh, and, and our previous speaker as well, graphene shows promise uh, because it has a high car carrier mobility, it's a semi-metal behavior, and it's more importantly compat compatible with CMOS processing, so it makes the processing much simpler. So as I described uh, before, there are three components that have, we've been working on, and these actually are the backbone of a basic radio frequency communication system. You need a source or an oscillator, okay? And we, uh, in, in the literature, graphene has been shown to produce surface plasmonic polaritons in the terahertz range. So this is a candidate, a modulator. And in the literature, graphene have been shown to absorb some of this SPP waves based on the, an applied voltage across it. And we need an antenna. And again, graphene has been shown in the literature to be able to transmit generated SPP waves into space. So the idea is to make graphene, make this all this out of graphene, okay? And also the links between the components. So between the oscillator and the modulator out to the antenna, how are you gonna carry those SPP waves at the terahertz? You're gonna need a high carrier mobility material. So graphene may be able to do that. All right, so uh, describing a little bit our, uh, what the literature uh, shows about the making oscillators, here is a paper with, from Dr. Jornet, who is now at Northeastern University, which indicated that uh, on a, a 2D electron gas channel, you can actually, if, if you set your source and drain impedances correctly, you can generate a standing wave. And if you get those dimensions correctly, that standing wave will be at a terahertz frequency. That standing wave could be emitted out and uh, at a terahertz. So um, looking at that, he also was tried to determine what are the right impedance conditions. And he looked at the capacitance between at the source and at the drain terminals of the components. Uh, this is some simulation that he performed. And he said that if your capacitance at the source and the drain are equal, well, you don't really get much resonance. But if you make the capacitance at the source much larger than the capacitance at, at the drain, and remember capacitance is, capacitance is the inverse of impedance, uh, you do get resonant as the carriers that are generated at the source bumped uh, with the higher impedance at the drain and they get and they get sent back they kind of bounce back and forth as they can uh, escape out of the channel so that's what the basic physical um, 
uh, phenomena is that is taking place. He also looked at the energy that this would produce, uh, the radiator, radiated electromagnetic power per unit channel. And based on the simulations, he determined that he would get about 4.2 times 10 to the minus eight watts per micrometer. So if you wanna get any meaningful radiation out of these devices, you at least need to uh, one milliwatt. So you have to make these devices quite large in terms of their, their widths. So having all that in mind, this is what we proposed. Uh, we proposed a uh, graphene, uh, basically it looks like a graphene FET with a source and a drain and a gate. This gate here is, is used to initiate the vibrations, the oscillations, and really in theory, you only need to initiate it once. Once you get it going, they should sustain, but we know there's gonna be losses. So some sort of locking amplifier or locking mechanism to amplify the frequency as a driven frequency would be necessary. Um, if we look at the impedance conditions that were determined by Dr. Jornet, uh, we can use the equation that represents the capacitance between metal lines as the capacitance between the gate and the source and the gate and the drain will be determined by that. And uh, we can determine what the distance would be playing with that capacitance. Uh, it will be determined by the distance between the gate to the source and the gate to the drain. So as you can see in this example, we're saying let's make a source that it's a lot wider than the drain and also put it closer to the gate and the drain farther away from the gate to get those capacitance values. Now we need to make it large because we said that the energy produced was pretty low. So in our proposal, we're gonna make, we're gonna put 2,648 2, of these devices in parallel all together to produce that much energy. Uh, so we could do that two different ways. We could do it um, by changing the sizes a little bit and, um, uh, and also making this funneling, this funneling effect of the graphene. The graphene will be in the green. So that funneling effect, we can do it two different ways. And again, we can play with the distances. So these are three examples of where the impedance of the source is always smaller than the impedance on the gate. But as you can see, there's different variations. Uh, the design number three is more of a square. Um, the funnel is, is much uh, sharper, if you wish, uh, as compared to design two or design one. Design four is where we say, well, let's make this uh, an exaggerated or, or an extreme case where if you can see in here, the, gate, the sources are extremely large and the drains are extremely small. Um, the sources are a thousand microns in width, the drains are 40 microns in width. So uh, that's another extreme. Uh, we actually are in the process of fabricating this and a lot of this work was done by a senior project by Sarah Taylor and we have some upcoming results, uh, but as with this as far as we took it. Uh, on the next front, we have the modulator. And again, this has, been, this has been shown in literature that uh, you can obtain graphene plasma modulation at the terahertz frequency. And this is work from 2012, where the voltage across a graphene layer that was illuminated with a terahertz signal was able to modulate the terahertz signal that was reflected back. Okay, so if uh, what we're showing here is uh, a normalized reflectance. So one would be that all the signal was reflected back. So if your voltage across the graphene layer was between minus 20 and minus 10 volts, the whole signal was uh, As you change the voltage across the graphene layer, more of that signal was absorbed. Okay, so this shows that you are absorbing some of your terahertz frequency. And guess what? You can then modulate your terahertz signal that way. All right. Here's a, an example of how that would be done. How that would be done in a uh, monolithic device. So here's a graphene 
film, bringing in an SPP layer, so this is a plasmonic at a terahertz frequency. As you go over this region, this is your modulating region, you have an electric field across your graphene, not directly connected to graphene, but an electric field across the, the graphene. And you could make that graphene absorb some of this signal or not. And then you're modulating your terahertz signal that was produced by your oscillator or your source. Okay. And this is our approach. So this is again by Dr. Jarnett. That's theoretically how that will be done. Uh, this is not ready yet because we don't have a graphene source. So an approach that we use was to have a terahertz uh, optical source illuminate a device which has a graphene layer encapsulated between uh, two electrodes. The top electrode is a set of metal fingers. The bottom electrode is a buried P plus silicon. And by applying a voltage across these two electrodes, you're effectively creating an electric field across your graphene and hopefully changing the amount that that graphene layer absorbs. Okay, how we fabricated this uh, in a master's thesis a few years back. And this is the process flow that we, that we proposed. Uh, we start with silicon, we put in some contacts, then we uh, did a, an implant, a, a phosphorus implant on the silicon. So this is the split plus layer. Then we grew an oxide. You can grow a thermal, thermal oxide in this case because your silicon is available. And we choose 3000 Armstrong so that we could see the graphene that it's on top. We could have chosen 900 um, uh, Armstrongs as well. That's another uh, thickness that would have been uh, um, more efficient uh, uh, per se. And then we put in the graphene down. Uh, we use a PMMA mediated process. We're in the process of developing another process of doing that, but the graphene was put down. Uh, then a dielectric on top of that graphene so that we could put the contact fingers right on the top uh, to create the capacitance to, to apply that electric field. Uh, before the metal fingers were put down, we etched some contacts down to the P plus. Um, and then we uh, lift off process for the metal fingers. Uh, so that, that was the fabrication itself, but that wasn't it. Then we also had to package this so that we could test in a real communication system. So that, as I will show in the next slides. Uh, some details on the modulator design. Uh, this is the mask that we use and we actually made them quite big because we were going, we had to illuminate, illuminate this with a, um, with a, a, an antenna source that had quite a wide um, uh, beam. So we made this five millimeters by five millimeters. And this is showing that uh, in the first quadrant, we had one micron lines and spaces. On the second quadrant, one micron lines, two micron spaces. And, and the third quadrant, one micron lines, half micron spaces. And on the fourth quadrant, one micron lines with varying spaces. Uh, the transfer process was critical and we did a lot of work on investigating how to do that more effectively. And uh, here we are showing the process that we follow. This is a wet process, a PMMA transfer process. And uh, this has been published, but uh, the results are not really that easy to implement. So we ended up having this done by a company that specializes on these transfers uh, for our devices. At the same time, now we're looking at uh, applying a lamination, lamination transfer method. And this is based on a recently published uh, paper uh, where basically you just uh, start with the graphene on copper, uh, you soak it overnight so that the graphene and the copper oxidize and, and they start to come away from each other. Then you laminate that on a PVA film, which is water soluble. And then you laminate that onto your silicon substrate. And then you remove that water soluble uh, amount or, or film, transfer film. The Raman spectroscopy that I'm showing in here is normally used to quantify the quality of your graphene. And, the lam and having a second peak here higher than your first peak usually indicates that you do have single layer graphene. 
uh, when they're more equal to each other, like on this bottom picture, it indicates that you might have multiple layers of graphene. So what I'm showing in here is that our lamination process may produce slightly better or, or higher quality graphene than the uh, uh, PMMA water mediated process. So that's an, uh, um, an improvement on our process. Uh, in any case, we were able to fabricate these devices and this is, shows the last step where we laid down the metal fingers. And the challenge here is that this metal fingers only being one micron in width, they have to be uh, uniform and the whole length, the whole five millimeters of them has to have no breaks. And that was, that proved to be a challenge for this large area devices. Uh, we did this on six inch wafers. So you can see the entirety of the wafer. The, the uh, graphene film was placed uh, about two inch by two inch in the middle of the wafer. And then uh, the metal fingers, you can see the, the four different designs on the, on the surface. A little more of a close up picture. You can see, you, we see the metal lines here with the spacing between it, just as we wanted it to be. Uh, this is one micron lines, one micron spaces, and the slight, slight deviations uh, from the intended results. And this is a close up picture where you can see the graphene film um, and its defects. Uh, that's one of the big issues about graphene films that, in many cases, they're not uniform throughout the entirety of of them, especially for large area transfers. So that's something to keep in mind as you're making devices that are larger than the lab grade devices, uh, which are only in the few nanometers range. As you go going larger, you're gonna have more challenges on that. Uh, in any case, we were able to, to complete the fabrication and uh, the last part was to test it. Now, before we could test it, we had to dice up the devices. So in this picture, I'm showing just the final uh, chip itself. So it's separated from the wafer. And we also had to package it on a way where we could actually access the contacts and create that electric field uh, between them. So we wire bonded it to a PCV, the copper PCV bore. So you can see here the wire bonds connecting to the top electrode and the bottom electrode for all the four different versions of the devices that we have in here. And we took this to the uh, University of Buffalo, uh, Dr. Jordanet's lab. He's now at Northeastern, but his system provides a terahertz signal that it's up converted for 200, from a 250 gigahertz signal that is produced electronically. So it's not an optical system, it's an electronic system. And he actually has an antenna that produces the signal. So here's a picture of the antenna and the test setup. So this is the source. The terahertz signal was sent wirelessly to the modulator and then it bounced back to the receiver. Uh, and this pins, this connections here were used to apply that electric field across the graphene. And for, uh, and we monitor the reflected signal and the results showed as we're in this picture here, the results show, uh, show here that for zero volts applied, uh, the signal that was picked up by the receiver is in the blue, okay? So the amplitude of this was 125 microvolts um, uh, with respect to a, uh, to, to a signal that was sent uh, one, one millivolt signal. Then we applied nine volts across that electric, that uh, graphene, and we saw that the signal now received had decreased to 110 microvolts. Then we de increased that to 12 volts, and we saw that the signal was decreased to 80 microvolts, and at 24 volts, it had been decreased to 20 microvolts. So we definitely saw modulation of that received signal. And what we're seeing here is really the, the uh, terahertz signal, right? As it, as it goes up and down in voltage as it's received. So this is a real measurement uh, of a terahertz wireless, wirelessly transmitted signal. If you we applied, we applied a bunch of different voltages and we plotted it versus the reflected powers in DVM. And uh, 
as you go low in your voltage, you're not modulating your graphene. And as you go higher or your signal, as you go higher in voltage, you start to absorb some of that signal that is sent back. And this actually matches what was accomplished with an optical system uh, back in 2012. So we're pretty happy with those results, uh, but we do have some improvements that we want to make. We want to encapsulate the graphene with hexaboronitrite. I think that would uh, result in better, better results. Uh, the contact cut layer, we had an issue here where we think that the graphene might have been shorted in some of our devices. Uh, Liftoff process, we want to improve the resolution lines. And then we also want to protect the uh, devices as we're wafer sawing and singulating the chips uh, because sometimes we do have some defects that could affect the device performance. To put it all together now, the, the modulator and the source, we've come up with a process where they could be fabricated in the same chip and at the same time. And this was developed by Sarah Taylor. Um, and here's a cross section of what those devices would look like. As you can see, a lot of these layers are, are the same. Uh, we have the graphene layer, we have an oxide insulating, and then the metal layers right on top. So there's no reason why we couldn't do this at the same time. Here's a process flow on how that would be done. You would start with your silicon substrate, implant the uh, bottom plate for your modulator, grow an oxide on top, deposit a hexaboronitrite layer. This will make sure that the graphene that goes on top, it's nice and uh, well preserved and um, uh, preserve its, its qualities. Then we could pattern that graphene just to separate the two, or we could actually leave a link between the two. So if we're creating the oscillations on one side, they can be transferred to the modulator uh, and we don't need that external terahertz uh, uh, source anymore. Then we'll put, we would put on a, either a TOS or not ALD, aluminum oxide has shown to be a very good insulation, insulator. Excuse me, Dr. Pocheres, do you have five minutes more, please? Okay, I think that that would be just- Thank you. Uh, and then uh, let's see, so, so we put an insulating layer and then cut some contact cuts. And uh, again, the, the last step here would be to uh, put metal connections and metal connections uh, will result on the final structure that we're intending. Uh, the source with, with its three terminals and the modulator with the electric field across the uh, graphene to modulate the signal. Okay, so that was perfect timing because I've come down to the conclusions here. So. Uh, the terahertz communication systems are expected in the near future and they're necessary for 6G applications. Uh, there are, there's work on different exotic devices uh, which are by themselves gonna become expensive. So using graphene in a monolithic way, it, uh, it lowers the price of those devices and makes this technology available to the uh, wider community. So. That's one of our goals as well. Uh, the hardware needs to be developed and implemented and not only in the lab, we also need to start doing some real testing with uh, real wireless signals. Uh, we have demonstrated a modulator based on graphene. Uh, we're working now hard to integrate uh, all the other components such as the source and the antenna as well as the links between them. And we believe we can do it all with graphene. And this is on a collaboration with Dr. Jernet at Northeastern University. He is an expert at uh, terahertz communication systems and he is really providing a lot of feedback on our systems. Um, and that's it, that's all I had. So do you have any questions? Well, uh, uh, Dr. Acevedo, I believe you're muted. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Aníbal asks, uh, you mentioned the defects in the graphene channel can degrade your device's performance, but what about traps with oxide? Do they have an impact on the terahertz devices? 
Yes, all all defects, uh, defects in traps and graphene discontinuities, they're all going to affect the terahertz, uh, the, the uh, performance of your device. They could affect it in different ways. Uh, I believe for the um, source, they may actually shift the frequency at which it resonates. I have, we have some preliminary simulations that indicate that. Uh, in the modulator, they could affect the way that your signal is modulated. So yeah, all those, all those need to be studied and understood. Thank you. Miguel asks, uh, what modulation technique is used in the modulator? So right now, uh, the, the, the expected technique is to just be an amplitude modulation. That's what we're showing uh, as the most effective. Uh, but you're right, there are other more complex modulation techniques that are more applicable to higher frequencies. And for this demonstration, it was just an amplitude modulation. But phase modulation, uh, some other more complex techniques will be necessary. And Dr. Jornet, actually, if you look up his papers, he's got some, some good ideas on that. Uh, what is the throughput uh, achieved? Throughput in terms of yield or um, throughput in terms of power? Um, in terms of yield. Yield. Uh, yield in terms of fabrication. How many of these devices are actually um, uh, successful? Uh, the yield is low. We got uh, maybe three modulators out of that whole six inch wafer that actually works. So three out of many, three out of a few hundreds. And we believe that the reason for that is because we did not use a hexaboronitrite sub layer. It was just a graphene uh, on SiO2, which we have learned since then that is not the best practice. Uh, we actually did see time uh, a time effect where a modulator that worked one day, two weeks later did not work because of that graphene mismatch with the SiO2. Well, that's what we believe the, the problem was. So hexaboronitrite is key to make these devices work. Okay, thank you. Um, everybody is giving you congratulations for your excellent presentation, Dr. Pichega. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Okay, uh, Dr. Eloy, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Marielena. Um, Dr. Puchades, uh, thank you for your out outstanding presentation. I, I was uh, deeply impressed by your excellent results you showed. I have a couple of questions. Um, first question, which are the targeted bands to conceive terahertz communication systems in these uh, studies? Mm -hmm. So the, the system that uh, is actually available, it's a, it's a uh, center frequency of one terahertz. So that's the center frequency. As far as the bands, uh, we haven't really studied them, but uh, I think it's expected that you, you can have bands in the hundreds of gigahertz. Hundreds of gigahertz. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, uh, that's my next question. Which was the speed of the data transmission in your first uh, tests? So it was basically a DC, uh, just uh, the uh, demonstration. Yeah, just we, the demonstration of the carrier. Right. Yeah, just the demonstration. Th those biases were just a DC, so there was really no active modulation. It was a static, static modulation. We're hoping to get some active modulation. Uh, on our second round of tests. And that's when we went back to the lab two weeks later and our graphene seemed to have relaxed and it wasn't really modulating anymore. Oh, okay, okay, understand. And what about the uh, antenna technology? W which was the antenna technology you used in these uh, tests? So the antenna that is on the system at Northeastern University, I'll show you. It's it's basically a horn antenna. A horn antenna. Yeah. Now, okay. on, 
Yeah, so when we go uh, to develop the graphene antennas monolithically on, on our substrate, we'll probably look at, at a patch antenna or even a, um, uh, just a, a, a simple um, um, monopole antenna, I think would be applicable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I thank you again for your presentation. It was pretty, pretty interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. Chavez. Thank you, Dr. Marilena. Thank you, Dr. Eloy. Well, thank you to you, Dr. Puchet. Um, we are awarding you this diploma. I'm going to uh, share it. El Instituto Politécnico Nacional otorga el presente reconocimiento a Iván Pochades por su participación en el seminario en línea High Frequency Anterahertz Devices and Circuits Perspectives on Emerging and Advanced Technologies Part 1 con la conferencia Terahertz Communication Based on Graphene Devices llevada a cabo los días 26 y 27 de noviembre de 2020 eh, la técnica al servicio de la patria. Eh, thank you very much, Dr. Puchávez, for your presentation. You're welcome, and thank you very much for inviting me.